Hi everyone, Nick Kane here, and I've got a short presentation today on the major fields or subfields within public policy. So let me share my screen and we can talk more a little bit more about it today. All right, so we've got an overview of the major fields of policy studies or the major three major areas within policy studies. The goal is to just provide you with a little context to understand where policy analysis fits into the larger set of fields or issues that we deal with in policy. So public policy studies and analysis has been called more a mood more than a science by Moran, Rain, and Godin in this great book, The Oxford Handbook of Public Policy. And there are many subfields within public policy. So they're often by issue area healthcare, environment, security, and so forth. I think I counted over 70 different classes on the Saul Price website. However, there are three major common areas of study within those fields or, or that kind of cut across those fields. And they are, first of all, policy analysis, which asks what should we do to address a policy problem? Secondly, there's the study of the policy process, which seeks to understand how does policy work? How is it made? How is it implemented? And finally, there's policy evaluation, which asks what are the impacts of a policy, either retrospectively or looking forward? And I'm borrowing quite a bit from Smith and Larimar's excellent book, so I just put the screenshot up here so you can see it and, and um, if you're interested in these issues and you want to go a little deeper, I highly recommend it. So let's look a little bit, first of all, at these three areas. So policy analysis seeks to determine the best policy for a given issue or problem. That is what we're focused on here in PPD 554. Policy process seeks to understand how and why of policy making. And that is addressed in PPD 555, which you will take next semester if you're on a standard MPP um, schedule. And then finally, there's policy evaluation, which is focused on, on the systematic assessment of the consequences of a policy using empirical methods. That is covered in PPD 542 and in other classes. So looking a little bit uh, in a little more depth at policy analysis, the key questions in policy analysis are what should we do to address a policy problem? And the objectives of policy analysis are to diagnose the problem and find the best policy. The approach is often um, multidisciplinary and solution oriented and if you look to Harold Laswell's famous essay on policy analysis, um, he brings out these two qualities. And he also talks about it as located uh, within the democratic uh, approach to governance. So seen from this framework, policy analysis in a kind of traditional pose is somewhat technocratic. It's a little bit like a doctor trying to diagnose a patient. So this traditional model has some issues, which we will explore both in this presentation and throughout the semester. But to play it out, it asks, you know, what's the problem and how do we find a solution or how do we diagnose the solution to the problem and create some type of course of treatment? So the key challenges within public policy analysis are there are several, are, starts with agreeing on a problem framing. So how we frame a problem is often quite controversial. I can give you the example of um, healthcare in the United States, right? We can talk about, we, some, some um, observers of the healthcare system would say, hey, the problem is the way we deliver care, that our for-profit model is inherently flawed. Other people would say that the model is fine, but the way we implement it is a problem. So agreeing on what a quote unquote pro policy problem is can be quite 
uh, challenging and controversial. And we'll, we'll spend more time in the first few weeks here thinking and talking about problem framing. Another key challenge is just understanding the actual causes. To play out the medical analogy, you may go to the doctor with a certain symptom, thinking from your quick search using WebMD that you have a certain condition. The doctor may do tests, x-rays, blood work, and find out that actually you think you have a simple cough, but maybe you have something more serious. Uh, another key challenge is determining what we mean by best when we say trying to find the best policy. And again, we will address this and look at this issue in greater depth um, this semester. Developing a proposal can be a challenge. Um, just trying to predict the impacts or, or um, develop the best, the quote unquote best approach, and then projecting the impacts, of course, for a policy that we have not yet passed is in, it, in and of itself a challenge. Lastly, we have the challenge of weighing the trade-offs of one, of more, one or more policies and deciding what's the optimum route. And addressing each of these is tricky, as I've been highlighting, because each of these steps is, can be difficult um, from a, um, instrumental or technocratic fashion, doing it well, and controversial in terms of how we do it. So I would just pause to highlight here that to carry out these steps or address these challenges, we often need to draw on other fields. So just to pause for a second, any other subfields do you think that we've talked about that might be useful? And the obvious answer, I hope, is that to perform a, a, a quality policy analysis, you need to have at least some understanding of the policy process. And of course, some ability to evaluate the impacts or draw on uh, evaluation research. I'm also gonna point out that we've got six bullets here and eight steps in the Bardock and Potashnik Eightfold Path. Do you see any um, similarities? Okay, so turning to the second major area of inquiry, which is the policy process, it focuses on key questions such as how and why does the policy process work? And the objectives of policy process research are to understand the social and political processes that lead to the creation and implementation of a policy. Um, the approach is a little bit closer to political science and policy process research often focuses on agenda setting. It focuses on interest groups. Uh, it focuses on political institutions, courts, legislatures, the executive branch and so forth. And it focuses on bureaucracy and implementation. So I put a photo of the US Capitol here to remind us of the importance of traditional institutions in policy process studies. Um, but I overlay that with a, a screen grab from the end of Planet of the Apes to remind us that the informal rules of a, a given policy process or a given um, national context are often as important, if not more important. And given the challenges we've seen in the United States to both formal institutions and the informal mores and values that guide the policy process and the political process, I think it's worth pointing out that both of these formal and informal institutions are important to consider when you study the policy process. So we have several challenges when we look at public policy through the process lens. If politics equals power, where does that leave public policy? Bruce Bueno de Mesquita and his co-author Smith uh, in the excellent Dictator's Handbook point out that coming to office and staying in office are the most important things in politics. And so if politics is really to some degree an exercise in power, then that really challenges the technocratic model of finding the quote, optimum solution to a given problem. 
Smith and Larimar point out that money taints the process of representative democracy and really it taints the political process in, in every kind of national setting. Uh, the political scientist E.E. E. Schatzneider has a famous quote that I think is quite, quite relevant here. He says, the flaw in the pluralist heaven is that the heavenly chorus sings with a strong upper class accent. So this is kind of just a, a way of saying that money has an outsized influence when we, um, when we adopt the technocratic kind of high modernist approach to public policy. In the, in the high modernist approach um, pioneered by thinkers in our field like Harold Laswell, they said, well, you know, the public's not super important, but different interest groups will debate solutions and, and through that debate, they can come to some type of conclusion. Of course, if money has this outsized influence, then the most well-funded groups are going to have their policy uh, priorities implemented more often. And then, but I'll leave on a, whole, a more hopeful note, which I take from the Oxford Handbook of Public Policy, and they kind of point out that value clarification can be a, a, a legitimate and really important outcome from political discussions. So yes, politics can equal power, but politics can also help us understand what are our values and what kind of outcomes do we want to see in the world. Okay, so turning to outcomes in the world, we look finally at policy evaluation. And policy evaluation is focused uh, often on the outputs of a public policy. Um, what is it, um, you know, how many homeless people are being served by a meal program? Um, how many houses are being built by a program to build housing, right? But the really deeper question is, what are the impacts that the policy is having on the broader world? So we may be serving many meals, but are we helping homeless people actually get out of uh, an unhoused situation? Uh, we might be building many houses through, a, through a, an affordable housing program, but if we are also, or if the society is also creating many unhoused people through other dynamics and other challenges in the, in the policy system, then of course the impact may be muted or, or non-existent. So the objective of policy evaluation is to systematically assess the impacts of either a past public policy when we use an ex post approach, or to look in a, in a forward thinking way at the impacts of a proposed policy. And that's called ex ante evaluation. So the approach of public policy evaluation is typically quantitative, uh, economic, and it often uses cost benefit analysis or some type of uh, cost benefit or benefit cost, depending how you like to phrase it. Um, techniques. And, you know, these are essentially ways of weighing um, what, which, which of several courses of action might be the best way to proceed. And obviously there's, a, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of research and theory and um, techniques to make, these, to make these, uh, this weighing a little more um, tractable. So there, there's some, definitely some challenges in public policy evaluation. Act, accurately predicting the ex ante impacts is hard. So when you're looking forward, you're estimating the impact of a policy that you haven't yet implemented on the larger world. This can be quite hard to do. You're making many assumptions about, first of all, whether the policy is going to be effective in creating the outputs that you hope, such as homes or meals served or whatever the policy, whatever the area or issue you're addressing and then thinking well, whether these outputs are actually going to create the outcomes that you want to see in the broader world. And measuring and monetizing these impacts, which is a key, key steps in policy evaluation, are also can be quite difficult. So figuring out um, the best way to, for instance, just being able to count unhoused people can be quite controversial. How do we do it accurately, right? Um, they're often, Difficult, they, they're often difficult to count because unhoused people have quite a bit of suspicion of um, government agencies and government workers. And they may not just 
stand on the street corner and wave their arms and say, hey, count me. You know, Los Angeles County, for instance, um, goes, typically performs a homeless census or, or a count of unhoused individuals once per year and sends out field workers to do it. And then monetizing these impacts uh, or, or monetizing the conditions and the impacts um, that a policy wants to address can also be quite difficult. And there's also some problematic issues that you come upon when you're trying to conduct these evaluations, such as valuing a human life um, or valuing a non-market benefits or costs. So to kind of wrap up and help you integrate how these three fields or areas of inquiry are related, uh, I just highlight and point out again that public policy is not a unified field. It's really a collection of many different subfields. With that said, there are three main areas of inquiry, which include policy analysis, which is what we're doing with this class, the policy process, which you'll be tackling in 555, and policy evaluation, which you could study in 542 and in other classes. But the reason I bring these all up again is that to effectively analyze a process, or I'm sorry, to effectively analyze a a, a policy problem and devise a proposal or solution requires you to think and understand a little bit uh, about the policy process, right? Because as you're designing a proposal to solve or address a particular issue, you have to understand a little bit about the process in a given uh, context. So they're intimately connected. And at the same time, as you're weighing one or more policy proposals, you're asking the question of what are the impacts? And in asking that question, you're engaging in policy evaluation or you're making use of policy evaluation research. So in summary, you can see our policy field as having three major areas of inquiry, policy analysis, policy process studies, and public policy evaluation. At the same time, these three areas of inquiry are often tightly linked. So I hope this presentation has given you a little bit more of a sense of the context of for what we're doing in this class and an understanding of why and how you might carry out um, policy process research and policy evaluation research. Thank you for your time and I look forward to discussing these issues with you in class.